Armitage continued to shine and had a key role in helping to sustain the colonies that continued to expand eastwards. That was until a sudden loss of communication sparked concern across the UEE. Agents of the Intersystem Police Force, the Advocacy. Vasquez and Lamar had been given the task of investigating this loss of communication from Dell, a settlement within Armitage. Their assessment only posed more questions. Initial visual from the sky indicate repeated strafing runs of airborne weaponry on multiple, presumably small craft. No obvious use of large bore weapons or bombs. Large scorch marks on eastern and southwestern outskirts of town indicate that this is where the attackers landed. Samples of scorched earth sent to lab for analysis. Angles of strafes are consistent with theory that the attackers came from multiple directions. Com tower was damaged, but did not look specifically targeted. Odd. If it were raiders, wouldn't their first target be the comms? On the ground, sweeps turned up strange shell casings for hard ammo scattered throughout the town. Doesn't look human in manufacture. We'll analyse. Forward onto advocacy agents with contacts in Bano Protectorate. Attackers were thorough, sweeping house to house, killing everything and everyone here. Entire 638 population of settlement has been accounted for, except one. John Phillips, 38 standard earth years old, a farmer. Nothing to indicate why he was targeted, if in fact he was. Analysts are delving into him. We'll provide complete file when complete. Theft, robbery, appears to be the chief motivation but there is inconsistency among the missing items. Sometimes objects of value are left while seemingly useless trivial objects have been taken. Agent Vasquez has discovered a small comlink camera that somehow was operational during the attack. Scrubbed through the footage and found that it was mostly useless. There was one frame that when zoomed and cleaned up, appears to give a brief glimpse of an attacker. They were called the Vandal. This was another new species, the fourth to come to light and the UEE were fearful, based on the attacks at Dell, that they weren't going to be friendly. Eager to understand why the attacks happened to begin with, the UEE studied the Vandal in detail. It appeared that this species was somewhat nomadic. Travelling in hordes, they seek out hotspots of resources they need and use these territories as supply zones. They were clearly not amused by human occupation on one of these supply zones. Bracing themselves for a further attack for weeks, the UEE placed the Navy and Marines on high alert. But nothing happened. When the attacks did come, they were relentless. In just six months, 15 raids took place on outposts within the Orion system. These raids were violent and the casualties too high to count. Politicians within the UEE reassured the public that this threat would be neutralised, but behind the scenes, things weren't so straightforward. In a bid to rewrite the history books, the UEE had colonised a system so far away that in turn made it too difficult to deploy the amount of naval units and supplies they needed to have any chance of victory. Whilst the public weren't happy at the lack of extensive action, they soon shifted their focus to new challenges. Those who had colonised the planet were escorted to new worlds, and Armitage was left abandoned. The early 28th century posed more challenges than the UEE could have predicted. The intensifying Cold War with the Xi'an had now been going on for almost 200 years and the navy and military resources needed to keep up this level of protection couldn't be sustained. They were stretched thin across the periline, a series of systems that formed a no man's land between the UEE and Xi'an Empire during the Cold War. Over on the opposite side of the UEE, the Vandal raids had added an extra layer of complexity to the UEE's growing list of issues. The Imperator was also in a precarious position, 
Whilst the human population was once obedient and keen to abide by the rules imposed, there were a growing group of activists who were beginning to see through the reams of propaganda on show and the Mesa regime was looking unstable. In 2715, Imperator Samuel Mesa VIII was assassinated, but his replacement, Galore, Samuel's older brother, did nothing to instill confidence in the Empire's rulers. In the midst of the chaos, a glimmer of hope emerged, but would we realise its importance before it was too late? Just one year after the assassination of Samuel Mesa, Arja Firmino was seeking adventure. Tired of her comfortable but mediocre life as the daughter of a construction magnate on Terra, she teamed up with Oisha Swen, a skilled pilot and mechanic. Basing themselves in the lawless town of Levski within the Nyx system, their partnership was questionable and centred on low-level smuggling missions. That was, until even that got too bland for Arja, and her bid to expand the duo's criminal empire led to her exile. As they drifted through the dark nebula of Nyx, unsure of their next move, Oisha tested out her scanner. Something strange had appeared on the readings, and the pair had found their next opportunity. They had discovered a new jump point to an unknown system. Keen to capitalise on their findings, Argya suggested they travel to the Bremen system to meet with her network of trusted associates. They could provide them with the scanning equipment they needed to properly assess the fortunes they could make in this new system. Preempting the riches they would find, the pair spent their first night in the Bremen system celebrating their success. Oisha, celebrating maybe a little too much, waking the next day to discover in her drunken haze that Ardia was gone. Before venturing to find her, she clicked on the news reports. Her heart sank. Reports of a new system being discovered were everywhere, and Ardia had taken all the credit. Oisha was not going to take this line down, and wanted her moment in the spotlight too. She went to the Terra Gazette, armed with the evidence of her part in the discovery, along with a little dirt on the smuggling operations they had been part of. Of course, Ardia denied this at first, and after a brief scandal, the Department of Transportation and Navigation awarded credit for the system's discovery to both Ardia Firmino, since it was her ship, and Oisha Swen for being the first pilot to successfully navigate the jump point. The two subsequently had warrants issued for their arrest. Further investigation of the new system showed it offered little opportunity and had no planets of interest. Furthermore, to get there, pilots would need to navigate through the unclaimed Nyx system. The UEE saw no value in wasting any more resource to claim this system and continued to focus on the more pressing matters of war, raids and political unrest. But the story doesn't end there. A few years later, another jump point to reach the system was discovered during a Navy wreck patrol of the Yoya system. This was a big deal. It was now connected to the Perry Line and could have a key part in the Cold War. In 2721, it was formally claimed by the UEE and given its name. Towhill, after an ancient god of war to officially align it with the other Perry Line systems. Forces were moved into the system in the event that their resources were needed to press on into the Oya system or to fend off a Xi'an invasion. Further exploration yielded yet another jump point to Towhill through the Virtus system. While this meant the system was much more connected than previously thought, the Xi'an already had a presence in the Virtus system, meaning they were much more connected to Towhill than us. The military simply didn't have the resources to guard both jump points, and reinforcements could only be called through the Nyx system two jump points away. Instead, they retreated to Castra, a system for military use to monitor and maintain a network of proximity sensors near to Towhill's many jump points.
the painfully short life of Antony Tanaka. Over 200 years have passed since Ivor Messer ascended to the role of Prime Citizen, the first phase in his evolution into the First Imperator. Over those centuries, the Messer family have tightened their grip on the Fountain of Power, stripping the Senate of most of their authority and corrupting the advocacy into their private police force. The fear of Xi'an and Vandul, initially used by Messer to consolidate his power, has kept the populace in line, but no more. Antony Tanaka knew none of this history. Born in the slums of Newcastle on Borrio in Magnus, Antony knew only a world of checkpoints and government brutality. At the time, Magnus had become a prime manufacturing site for the munitions of the UEE's massive war machine so the local populace were subjected to ever-increasing scrutiny and random searches to find the undesirables and traitors the propaganda dispatches were always warning against. Neighbours and friends would disappear in the middle of the night, and the only official answer to inquiries involved seditious or anarchist activity. Tanaka's parents both worked in the factories and lived under the blanket of fear without question. At the age of seven, Antony was called to work at the airball plant. His parents didn't raise a word of protest. They sank their shoulders and lowered their heads further. Tanaka worked at airball in their munitions division. His size allowing him to clean out scrubber systems more effectively than the adults. For four years, Antony lived in a company barracks with 50 other child employees and worked six days a week, with the last day spent in the mandatory learning programme studying human history. His wages were virtually non-existent, absorbed by housing, education and food charges levied by Airball. Earlier this year, Lane Corpus, the Imperator's distant cousin, was appointed to administrate the Magnus system after a noticeable decline in product quality. Corpus had a well-documented vicious streak. The Imperator believed that he could entice the populace of the system back to their previous standards. His first order, upon touring the facility, was to cancel the learning program and force the underage workers to work all week. The conditions around the factory diminished almost uniformly, especially when the Guard, a unit of advocacy agents assigned as Corpus's personal enforcers, took over security. Shifts were extended by two, then four, then six hours. Available food was skimmed to the barest of essentials that would prevent workers from collapsing on their machines. The depths of cruelty and indifference eventually managed to unlock something in the downtrodden and defeated workers. They found a limit where they wouldn't take any more. Yesterday, 3rd of December, 2757, on the tail end of a 16-hour shift, Antony Tanaka's foreman ordered him to pick up the shift of a co-worker who went into anaphylactic shock after exposure to a ruptured chemical canister. Antony refused. This boy of 12 years old, withered rail thin from exhaustion and malnutrition, stood his ground against the foreman. Again and again, the boy refused. The foreman tried to silence the child, but the boy kept refusing. His voice eventually overcame the screech and din of the working factory, attracting the attention of the other workers who watched in silence. The machines slowly stopped until there was just the defiant, sobbing voice of Antony Tanaka, repeatedly refusing to work anymore. A guardsman entered the factory floor. He calmly approached the young boy, took one look at his dirty face, then drew his sidearm. The whole time, the workers did nothing. We cannot let him die in vain. Antony Tanaka must become the symbol of humanity, no longer being willing to put up with the cruelty of the messers. A mood had been growing for quite some time, 
a desire to burn down the corrupt institution that dominated humanity. It would still take 35 years, but to some, the Mesa era began to fall when that shot ended the painfully short life of Anthony Tanaka. The citizens of Boro thought that they were ready. They had orbital defences, deep space scanners, auto locks. With all this, they thought that they were safe. But when a Vandor warband hits, you have to be more than ready. At 17.23 local time, the attack began. Fortunately, a call went out almost immediately. Local militia from around the system scrambled to their ships to rout the raiders, but it wasn't until the UEE fleet arrived that the Vandor fled like cowards back into the dark of space. The Vandal attack lasted 27 minutes. In that time, 14 souls were extinguished and millions in property were destroyed or looted. The Cold War has been brewing. It could go either way, but the military can't continue to deal with this and the continued Vandal raids. Something has got to give. My hope is that we can find a way to bring our two great species together, rather than keeping them apart. Both of our cultures would benefit greatly by having a friend on the other side of the periline, instead of an enemy. Senator Akari met with the Xi'an, to create the Kray Akari Treaty that would hopefully defuse tensions with the Xi'an. Given the Imperator's use of the Xi'an to control humanity, this treaty would mark the beginning of the end of the Mesa era. Zero six twelve, officers meeting. Went through the comsec updates from the previous six hours. Nothing startling. Report of a weapons discharge on a Reaper class in the Kiel system. A deck cannon misfired after a computer error. No impact. Locally, our mirror was holding position. Zero seven twenty four, reported for duty. Commander is still down with the bug. Ran system-wide diagnostic and validated weapon packages. Clear across the board. Watched our mirror run flight drills. Look like rapid deployment simulations in Upper Atmo. 11.15. Nils sounded like he was coming down with something. All was quiet so I sent him to medical. His second was more than capable as a substitute. 12.32. Finally got some chow. Boredom seems to be really getting to the crew. Some tempers even flared today in the mess. We'll relay to the commander and try to come up with possible solutions to relieve some stress. 1534. I don't know where to start. I was working on my battle sim assessment of the Xi'an carrier when Shaw alerted me to the news on the spectrum. Turned on bridge monitors. Apparently, Senator Akari from Terra independently brokered a treaty with the Xi'an. It's supposed to take effect at 1900. The intersystem comms absolutely lit up. People thought it was a joke. Maybe some activists cracked the news orgs? Wouldn't be the first time. We couldn't honour this treaty, right? Should we arrest Akari for treason? The news wouldn't reach Earth for days, so no one knew what to do. I was just as dumbfounded as everyone else, so I notified the commander, who immediately reported to the bridge. 1620. Everyone's still flying blind. All ships are on high alert. 
looking for any kind of aggression from our mirrors. So far, nothing. This could all be a Xi'an trick. I wouldn't put it past the slinks to try something this elaborate. 1902. Our Xi'an mirror recalled its fighter patrols, powered down its weapons, and backed away. <laughs>